Listen, I want to tell you, there's nothing worse than burying a small child. No, there's nothing worse than that. It's been just a couple years ago, and, and I've done several children's funerals. But the one that burns in my mind that I could close my eyes and go back to it right now was I got a call to do a graveside service and and, and they asked me would I come and do a graveside service. I said yes. I didn't even know who it was. I didn't know what it was. Who it was. Didn't know the age of them. And they told me, they said they're, they're just, just going to have a graveside service with you. And they told me what hollow to go up in and told me about where it'd be and so I drove where they told me to drive, and I got there just just a few minutes before the time for the service to start. And there were some cars parked, and I parked where two or three, four cars were parked. And it, it'd been, it was in the wintertime, and it had been snowing, and the snow had melted, and it was mushy. And I, I, had, I, I had boots on, and, and I, I walked around through there, and I came up on a hole that was about about three foot wide and about two foot wide. And I walked over there, and there was a box about this big. It was just a little bigger than a shoe box, a boot box about like it. And it was made out of wood. And it was about that tall. And the dad had dug the grave. How sad was that, that he dug his own child's grave. And the family gathered around. It was, it was born to... And then it died. I don't know if it was stillborn or if it lived a few days. But some of the family said, we'd like to view the baby. And they said, okay. And so he had an electric drill. And he undrilled four screws on the top of that little old wooden box. And he pulled it open. God, my heart broke. That was a baby doll looked like laying in there. It was as pretty a little girl as you ever seen. Had a little dress on, had little socks on, and his little head was turned over to the side. Had little hair, and my heart broke, and I wept. And I stood there at the in that mud of that grave, and I wept while they looked, and while they wept, I wept with them. I don't pretend to know the pain that family felt. I don't pretend to know that they had already had a room and already had clothes and already had bottles and already had diapers and they had all those things. I don't pretend to know the hurt they felt or the pain that they had or the emptiness that was in that home when they went back. We, we, we understand, we don't understand the pain and hurt of other people. And it's there. Maybe it's you that that your parents pushed aside. Maybe you wasn't the one they, they chose, and maybe they made you feel second best all the time. Maybe in public it was one way, but at the house you were treated in an entirely different way. Maybe that was you. The feeling of unloved and unwanted. You tried, but it was never enough to get the love that they had for me and they wanted for me. I, I've seen people, grown people that felt rejection. I have, I have witnessed them lay in the floor, in dirty floor, and weep like babies over rejection. It's not an age that it stops, and it's not a time that it stops. I, I, you know, and we're, we're talking about pain, and we're talking about hurt. We're not talking about petty feelings. And we're not talking about somebody not shaking your hand or, or somebody rubbing you the wrong way. We're not talking about that. Oh, my God. We're talking about pain. And we're talking about deep hurt that only you and God knows the hurt and the pain. Daniel Webster could not put the words of your pain. He could not explain the pain that some of you have in your lives. He couldn't tell it. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 through 17, if you want to turn there with me. Here's a lady. I'm not going to read all of it, but I'm just going to tell it to you. She's, been, she's wanting a baby. And she, her husband is a loving man. He cares about her, but he's got another wife. He, back in the good old days, you could have two wives. <laughs> and, <laughs> 
I've got it when I go home. But anyhow, she had two wives. He had two wives. And one of them was having children, and, and Hannah wasn't having any children. And the wife that was having children would, would mock her and make fun of her. And she knew that it was her that couldn't bear the children, not her husband. It was her that couldn't have children. And so there, that, that, that embarrassment and that shame, she wanted to give her husband children and give him sons and, and daughters. And she wanted to be like the other wife. And, and the other wife would just mock him, mock her. And even her husband said, well, ain't I better to you than ten sons? I mean, I, I love you. No doubt Hannah was probably his favorite. But still, she had a hurt that he couldn't understand. Are you hearing me? I said her husband never understood the pain that she was feeling. He never understood the hurt that he was that she was feeling. And so when she goes to the house of God and she gets down to pray and she begins to cry out and begin to pray, she begins to talk to God and as she's praying, the Bible said that her lips moves, but there was no voice. Nothing come out of her mouth. Just just her lips moving. It was always going on. Just she's just moving her lips, and she wasn't saying anything. There's nothing coming out. And Eli was sitting over in a chair by the post of the tabernacle, and he got to watching her. This man had been so long since he'd seen somebody travail. It had been so long since he'd seen somebody really seek after God that he perceived she was drunk. So he goes over to her, and he accuses her of being drunk. And she says to him, I've not, I've not been drinking or have any strong drunk wine or any strong drink. I've not done any of that. And he says, she says to him, listen in verse 13. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart. There are some times your lips can't say what your heart feels. You know, with, with, with mothers and grandmothers, I've heard them. They've come close. They'll look at a child, and, and, and they love it so much, they'll say, I could eat you up. I could bite a hunk out of you. I, I mean, they, what they're saying, is, I could consume you. I love you. My love for you is so great, I could consume you. I could take you in. The words, there are words that it, you cannot express how you feel. You know, that's the reason that sometimes when you pray, you pray in the Holy Ghost. For He makes moanings and utters for us that we don't even know how to express. There are times in your lives that you need just to come to an altar, amen, and not, not say so much. Just open your heart up and whatever's in your heart, just express it to God. It doesn't have to be out loud. You don't have to come to this altar this morning and, 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 and weep out loud. You can if you desire you can if you need to, or you can cry out in your heart, and you can pray in your heart, and you can pour it out in your heart, but you need to tell it to God. You need to express that. You need to weep and open up your heart and tell God all about it. God, I'm scared. God, this I don't feel like this has been right. Why? I know. Now listen, I, I'm not... I, I'm not like, a, I, I've heard preachers say you never ask God why. I've, I, I've heard old preachers that years ago, they said, never ask, don't never ask God why. But I'm being honest with you. I've got down and I've said, God, why? What did I do to deserve this? What, tell me what it is. I'll, I'll repent of it. I'll, I'll do whatever I need to do. But if I've done something to bring this up on me, God, tell me what it is. Listen to me. It ain't that people, we've got a misconception about it. We think when bad things happen, it's just that we've done something. Look at Job. God said to Job, there's, he's a perfect man. There's not one like him. And look at all the things that happened to him. Look at Joseph. Joseph was an honorable man and a perfect man. Look at all the things that happened to him. There are bad things that happen in your life that is no cause of your own. No cause of your own. It doesn't mean that you've done anything to bring this on you. 
accidents happen. One year, uh, Rowdy was, uh, we'd over at the lot, over at Buckhorn Fishing, and then we went down, and, and, and uh, there was a swing set there, and he wanted to play on the swing set. And, and, and just in a few minutes, we just let him go across the swing set, and he turned loose on those swing sets and fell and broke his arm. You know, you know, we shouldn't have went to the swing sets. I mean, why did we go to the swing? If we just come on home, ain't that the story? That's what we thought. If we just hadn't stopped by the swing sets, this would have never happened. You cannot stop things from happening. I would to God that we could. And I would to God that I could say to you, listen, there are things that happen in our lives that we can never fix. Now, you won't hear this in a lot of churches, but I'm telling you the truth. There are things that will happen in your life that cannot be fixed. Can't be fixed. You live from that place and that point, and you go forward. Sue, Sue has a saying all the time. She said, this is the new norm. My mouth, I don't smile with one side of my mouth. I got headaches. And, and, but I, it, it's the new norm. We just go, this is the normal. This is where we work from here and go forward. You, you, there's things that happen in your life. You lose people in your life. And, and the word is right. It's lost. They're gone. How sad that is. We lose, we lose parents. We lose loved ones. We lose children. We lose different ones. How sad that is. And the pain and the anguish that one feels. It's terrible. And so... Others move on, but the pain and hurt is still there for you. It's still there. Listen. You may be here today and you may be in trouble. Maybe it's spiritual. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's marital. Maybe it's a different lot of different things. Maybe your life is a living hell. I mean, it's just a mess. You've been hurt by the world, thrown down by friends, betrayed by families. It's just a mess. Your life's a mess, and you're living in a place of misery, a place of hell. Well, Jonah got in that place, and in Jonah chapter 2 and verse 2, and this is what Jonah said, and he said, I cried by reason of my affliction unto the Lord, and he heard me. Out of the belly of hell cried I, and thou heardest my voice. They're going to come to music. If you will this morning cry out to God, just tell him your heart. Tell him how you, preacher, is it going to fix it? No, it ain't going to fix it. No. You're missing what I'm saying. It ain't that it's going to fix it. It's that you have to have some relief. You've got to have a place that you can let this off, that you can let this out. A pressure cooker can only stand Am I right, Lily? So much pressure. And if it don't, it'll explode. Do you know, people get angry and they're not angry at you. They're just angry at themselves and the situation and the condition. You can only stand so much. There comes a place that we have to let it out. Joseph, he tried when his brothers got there. He went into another room and he wept and washed his face and come back out. But then there come a time when he saw him again. The pit, the prison, the hatred, the betrayals. You know, he named his children. Joseph tried to move on, but he never could. He tried to move on beyond his, before he ever, he ever saw his brother. He named the first one. His first child was named Ephraim. Ephraim, he said, means for God had made me forget all the afflictions and toils of my father's house. That's what his name means. It says it right in your Bible. Ephraim, for God has caused me to forget all my afflictions and toils in my father's house. He was saying, I'm trying to forget this. 
But you didn't name this.